liturgical oddities. It's a feast really kind of the Lord in some ways, but emphasizes the mother of God in most ways. And there's reasons for that, her obedience to the law, his obedience to the law, which he gave us, of course, because he had to be obedient to that what he gave, shouldn't he, you see? And the desire, the desire for sight, the desire to behold the Lord, repentance, many, many themes, of course, in these two readings especially. This day where we usually emphasize on Zacchaeus Sunday, this anticipation of the Triodian, which is coming up next week, the first week when we start using that book that we used throughout Lent, and the public and the Pharisee, there is a certain anticipation and theme going on there. But we're also blessed to have it on this great feast of the Mother of God. In Psalm 104, the psalmist says, Seek ye the Lord and be strengthened, seek ye his face at all times. There's a great emphasis in the Father's many times, is not only seeking the Lord, but to seek his face, to seek to be in his presence, to seek to actually to know him, to walk with him, to know him in a real way, not just some abstract way, not some way that's just an enigma to us, but in a real concrete way. Many passages in the scriptures speak of seeking the face of the Lord, especially in the Psalm. And we know that we can't see the face of the Lord and live according to Genesis, but yet we can see him in his incarnation. Yes, we cannot see God in his essence. Yes, we certainly cannot see God the Father, but Christ reveals all this to us so we can now see the Lord. And so there is this theme between these two characters, really, of Simeon and Zacchaeus, of seeing the Lord, beholding the Lord in reality. Now I remember that wonderful quote of Father Seraphim Rose, which is at the same time a very hard saying that you, you must see Christ in this life or you will not see him in the next. Shocking statement, but actually a very real statement if you ponder it very deeply. How can you expect to get to know someone in the next life you never desired to know in this life or made any effort to know? I always am reminded of uh, the late Archbishop Dimitri of thrice blessed memory when we have this service every year. Not only did he serve here many times, I have photographs of him serving here on this, and he it was a big feast for him to come here. For some reason, it always seemed to work out. He ordained our Deacon Lazarus on this day 18 years ago, so we can congratulate him later, probably to his chagrin. But <laughs> Archbishop Dimitri always talked about this in light of the Incarnation. And it is a feast of the Incarnation. This whole series of events from Nativity till now is the Incarnation. As you may well remember, those of you who were here back then, he always emphasized that a sermon should talk about somewhere about the Incarnation. Christ becoming man that we might be saved. And indeed, one time I remember at one of the conferences we had, probably here, someone asked him if they were blessed to serve the old calendar of Christmas as well as the new calendar of Christmas. And he said, you can serve it 40 times if you want, because every day between Nativity and the meeting of the Lord is a feast of the Incarnation. Now, I don't think he literally meant for to serve Nativity 40 times. He probably would have said something about it if he did. However, the point was, this is all celebrating that great thing that Christ has come into the world for us sinners. It is a beautiful thing, and it is the good news that we have, that Christ came to save sinners, of whom I am first, as we spoke about last week. So he talked about this in light of this anticipation, this preparation, because the sermon you can find very readily online of his on many sites about the meeting of the Lord, he preached it on a publican of the Pharisee Sundays. He was talking about that preparation, anticipation of great Lent, in which we try to put aside more worldly things, not only food, but worldly cares. He talked about all the false gods that we come up with on a day-to-day -day basis to sit in the place of Christ and throw themselves in our hearts in the place of Christ. We always need to remember that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. So we need to make our treasure with Christ, to put our heart with Christ. He talked about this was the time, as we hear in the scripture, that this man was set for the fall and rising of many in Jerusalem. So that means there is no lukewarmness with Christ. We really do need to make a decision, a firm decision in our lives, and turn that rudder toward the person of the Savior. Do we want to follow Christ, or do we want to be with the world? As we remember, he said to the Laodiceans, he was lukewarm, I will spit out. We don't want to be that lukewarm person. We want, And why would we want to be? Why not have partial Christ, which you really can't have? Have all of Christ in your life. So, so as the psalmist says, seek ye the face of the Lord at all times. 
Do everything in your day, everything in every minute you have to find Jesus Christ to make him enthroned in your hearts. And he will come and abide with you. So we have this man, Simeon, who according to tradition has been waiting for centuries to see the Savior. And the Savior comes to the temple with the mother of God and, her, and Joseph being obedient to the law to come on that 40th day to present that firstborn son to God. And they do so. Now remember the King James says it's time for her purification, but that's not actually correct. The Greek says their purification because really what the Father sees it means for all of our purification. The mother of God really did not need to be purified from what? There was no defilement, there was no corruption. She was pure. But she came because it was what you do, because it's what God told us to do. So she did it. So you come into the temple, and at once you can envision this scene, this old man, this very old priest comes and sees him. You can probably imagine the look on his face, what he has anticipated for hundreds of years he desired the Messiah with all of his heart, with everything that he had. And he embraced him in his arms and said, Now that thou thy servant depart from peace, for my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, light to light in the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. Now remember, imagine hearing that about your child. You won't, but that's what they heard from this man. It must have been astounding. They had already seen amazing things, of course, with visions of angels and Gabriel's appearance and the shepherds coming and the magi coming. But here was Simeon asking to be released, really, in the word, because that dismissal, that departure, has more of a sense of being enslaved to something in Greek, that he is being released from the bondage of this world and gets to go to be with he whom he has only desired to be with. And yet he had to wait the resurrection as well, but the joy that he felt, because he got to embrace the Savior, and because he had found the Savior, nothing else mattered. He could depart, nothing else mattered, nothing else to accomplish, nothing else to look at in this world. He had seen everything he needed to see. I'm always reminded of St. Porphyrios, who said that in our prayers we should only seek God, nothing for us, no, no help, no anything else, just Christ himself, for who he is. And St. Porphyrius is so bold as to say, whether he casts me into hell or not, that's fine, as long as I'm with the love of God. Now imagine that kind of desire for God. No matter what he does, we still seek God. Seeking God for his own rights. So when you pray, try to pray that you might find God. Not that you might get some bonus that you've been wanting, not the job you want, not the house you want, anything. Just God for his own sake. And no matter what God does, you will be with God. And what else could we possibly want in this life to see our salvation, embrace him as the angel bringing the fire from the altar to put on Isaiah's lips. We can embrace Christ in our hearts, that living coal of divinity that burns like that. The mother of God became those tongs that held the divinity of Christ. So can our hearts when we receive Holy Communion. The spoon that we receive it from, um, receive it as the tongs that Isaiah had on his lips, because that is indeed what happens when the priest and the deacon partake of the chalice. The, after the priest receives, he says, Lo, this has touched my lips to take away my iniquities and cleanse my sins, just as Isaiah said, and I say the same to the deacon, just changing the pronoun slightly. Now, then we have this person of Zacchaeus. But before I go there, think of Anna too. Anna comes and she sees something she has anticipated. And proclaims it to all, as we should do when we find Christ in hearts. But Zacchaeus was a man, as we know, without going into the full story of that, because we have too many sermons with that. Zacchaeus, a too long a sermon, Zacchaeus was not exactly a desirable character among the people of Israel. He was a tax collector. We don't like the IRS, but Zacchaeus was that, you know, on steroids. He was the one who could go around and manipulate and take things and manipulate people's money and extort and everything he wanted to do, and he did. A little short man, but something in his heart burned for Christ as well, as it does in all of ours, whether we admit it or not. The distractions sometimes keep, sometimes keep us from seeing that and feeling that. But Zacchaeus wanted to see what this commotion was about so much, he likely had heard about the Savior. This was running throughout Israel and Judah, that these, this man had come. 
and the miracles that he was working. So Zacchaeus seeks to climb up a tree. Not a very dignified thing for a grown man to do in that day and age, or any day and age really, but a little tiny man too, so he could see, say, and these people hated him. So likely they may have even mocked him, some of the writers say about this, but he did not care what the world said. He wanted to see Christ. And he did everything he could to elevate himself, use that image for ourselves, above the things of this world, above our sins, above our passions, that he might see the person of the Savior. And when he walked in that way of humility, as Elder Zacharias always says, he could not help but bump into Christ because he was on the same path of humility. When we walk the path of humility, we will see Christ. And he went up that tree, and the Savior calls him to come down, to make haste and come down, because the day he must abide in his house. When we walk in that way of humility, and follow the way of repentance as Zacchaeus did to make restoration in our lives by means of repentance, the Savior comes and dwells in our house, in our hearts, and literally in our own homes. We have to keep that in mind all the time when we're living in our homes and doing whatever it is we do. Is this what we want the Savior to be doing with us? Because He is. He is there with us at every time, in every place, and every circumstance. So we must seek to find Christ, to seek to find the face of the Lord. Now, you might say, I'm not Simeon. I'm not Zacchaeus. I can't physically see Christ, because they had that blessing to do. But then we should be immediately drawn to Thomas. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet have still believed. That is who we can be, those who have not physically seen but the eyes of our hearts, enlightened by the grace of the Holy Spirit and our baptisms and in Pentecost, makes it very real that Christ is seeable. Maybe not in that physical sense, but certainly with the eyes of the heart, those noetic eyes of the soul. Because we see him in communion, quite literally, his body and blood. We see him when we read the scriptures and we allow something to burn in our hearts that we are hearing. <coughs> We see him in our neighbor when we allow ourselves to experience some dialogos, some combination, not a monologue, but a conversation with someone else with Christ involved. And make it a trialogos. So we have him here speaking with us in our midst together, walking that road to Emmaus with the Savior walking with us. And on that road, we see Christ with our neighbor. If we walk with Christ with us and living the life of God, living a godly life, so we can see him. I know I've spoken to many of you now. Every one of you has this no way to conscious, whether we want to believe it or not. We come into the church sometimes, we clean, we do whatever we do, and it's quiet here, and we know that Christ is here. But it doesn't have to just be here. It can be everywhere. It can be in our prayer corner at night, in the morning. It can be at the traffic light when we're impatiently waiting for traffic. If we just take a breath and go, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Let go of everything in the world. And all the strengths that we have, I have this temptation, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. I have this struggle with my neighbor, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. I have all these difficulties in my life, everything is bad, I feel sick, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And just cling to that garment, hold him in your arms and say, Lord, let thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Because no one of us can claim not to see that. No one of us in this room can claim that. So what do we do? We must be as Zacchaeus and follow him from that point on which Zacchaeus did according to the tradition of the king of saint. We must be as Simeon and class form him and desire to depart in peace that you might be with him and add him to proclaim to the people and to be as the mother of God and bear these things in our hearts with prayer for the world. This is a glorious feast day. I don't know if many more that I enjoy more. This is a wonderful feast day because it is a feast of the Incarnation. It is a feast which Christ is born in our hearts. It is also, with Zacchaeus, a feast that we come up out of the things of this world and embarrass ourselves if necessary before the Lord and climb that tree and beg the Lord to come dwell in our hearts. And guess what? He does, He will, and He always will dwell with us as long as we live that life that seeks to maintain the face of God at all times in our sight. Amen. Amen.